Um, it's not clear how hard the problem is. So uh, first let me mention Shuichi Hirahara, who is a PhD student in Tokyo, um, who is certainly central to, to all of this. Um, we're really going to be talking about the minimum circuit size problem, which you get two inputs. One is a bit string f of length 2 to the m, which is just the truth table of a function. And you want to know how big the circuit, minimum circuit, is for that function. So you've got two numbers, f and i, and you want to know if the circuit size of f is less than or equal to i. So it's obviously in np because you've got the entire, the entire truth table, and the circuit doesn't need to be any bigger than that. So you've just got a linear number of, of uh, points that you need to guess the circuit and evaluate it on to see if it evaluates to uh, the given bit of the, the truth table. So how many people are already completely familiar with this? Okay, so. In particular, I don't know what you mean by circuit size. Okay, uh, a circuit is just a piece of hardware. It's got n inputs: x1, x2, dot dot dot, xn, and inside there there are um, and and or gates, let's say, or any kind of gates you want, and. Actually, I'm going to be a little vague about what circuit size is. It can either be the number of wires that connect the gates, or it can be the number of gates, or it could be the number of bits that you need to write this down in a normal way. And normally when we're talking about problems in NP, it doesn't make any difference, right? Like if you're talking about the satisfiability problem, you know, there are lots of different presentations of that problem you could give, and they're all equivalent, right? You can reduce one to the other. This is a weird problem in the sense that for each one of these different measures, you get a different problem, and we don't know how to reduce any one of them to the other. On the other hand, almost any time somebody's able to prove a theorem about this problem, it holds for all of these variants. So you can sort of think of this as a cloud of problems. And all of them are sitting here inside NP. There are very good reasons to think that none of them are in P. And opinion is sort of divided as to whether or not these, you know, it can be NP complete. Well, it sort of depends on the notion of reducibility. Yeah, yeah, it does. So, so that's what the problem is, or what the problems are, because there are different versions of it. Um, one theorem that we, or that that yeah, that we have that I'm going to be presenting, is showing that under a very modest assumption, a problem related to circuit minimization really is NP intermediate. And so, so instead of just a feeling, that'll actually be a, a theorem. But the problem is really an approximation problem. So, um, you know, the problem. Yeah, I mean, when, when, when Avi says there are very few, I mean, there are infinitely many. But the, so, so what, what's known about these intermediate problems? Uh, back in 1975, Ladner showed that if NP is different than P, then there are infinitely many problems in the middle here. But these are all really stupid problems. So what's it look like? You take satisfiability, 
which is NP complete. And for the first billion inputs, input lengths, your problem just looks like satisfiability until you're at a big enough input length that you're sure that the very first Turing machine does not solve satisfiability in, in you know, a given time, n to the k, that you're you're sure is going to happen because the assumption is p not equal to np. And once you've killed off that, then you're going to make the thing look like the empty set for the next 20 billion input lengths until you've verified that there's not a reduction from sat to this thing that looks like a finite set. And you keep bouncing back and forth. And so you can easily build things that are in here, but they're all really stupid. The question is, what about problems that are fairly natural? And the problem we're going to be considering is um, gap epsilon, where epsilon is going to be a function of the input length, mcsp, where it's really an approximation problem. So you want to uh, find a value, uh, let's call it s, such that the circuit size of your input f is less than or equal to s, and that's less than or equal to the circuit size of f times, uh, let's say, the length of the input is n, uh, n to the 1 minus epsilon of n. OK? So you just want to get a fairly bad approximation. The thing to notice is that if epsilon gets smaller, this is going to be easier to do. And in particular, if epsilon is little o of 1, you wouldn't expect this to be NP-complete. But why wouldn't you expect it to? It's because you know, we think NP-complete sets should require time at least 2 to the n of the delta for some delta bigger than, than 0. Um, certainly, this is what most people would conjecture. On the other hand, it is a fairly strong hypothesis on the complexity of NP-complete problems. So we will be using an assumption that doesn't seem to imply this. Because if you assume this, then there's all kinds of things that are probably NP uh, intermediate. So like um, if you want to find the optimal clique size in a graph with this notion of approximation, you know, as long as epsilon is little o of 1, then you wouldn't expect this to be NP complete. Um, and you, you know, that would be tight, because it is NP hard to do it with, uh, with epsilon, you know, any, any constant. Here n is the size of the truth table? Here n is the size of the input, the size of the truth table, yeah. OK. So let me just actually throw the floor open. Yeah. So um, just so we understand this, so the, the MCSP problem, mm -hmm. So even if you look at formula size, which is basically the case where the circuit is a tree, except you allow the inputs to be repeated down there at the bottom, we don't know much more. In fact, we know less about that problem than we do about, uh, about the minimum circuit size problem. Um, so we know. In fact, maybe I should just back up and tell you a few things that we, we know. Um, BPP is what you can do quickly in probabilistic 
you know, what, what you can do quickly, i.e. polynomial time, if you've got a machine that can flip coins. And if you've got a machine that can flip coins and make free calls to MCSP as a subroutine, then here you get a class that contains quite a few things. In particular, there's a complexity class called statistical zero knowledge that's got all kinds of crypto stuff in it. So basically, you pick any of your favorite cryptographic assumptions. Uh, they lie in here. And so if cryptography is possible, then there better be things in here that are hard to compute. But they're all easy if minimum circuit size problem is easy. We don't know that this holds for the minimum formula size problem, although some well-known cryptographic type problems like factoring um, what are called Blum integers, which you don't need to know about, but a very important special case of the factoring problem is all reducible to the minimum formula size problem. But um, you know, we we don't know a general reduction from a big complexity class to the minimum formula size problem. Similarly, you can reduce the class of circuits even more to get, you know, require that the, the circuits be, let's say, constant depth and or circuits, in which case we know even less until you get all the way down to DNF, which is just fan in two, or you know, depth two unbounded fan in circuits, at which point this problem becomes NP complete. So any intuition you might have about how this works is likely to be wrong, because it seems like the more you constrain the problem, the easier it gets, until you get down to the DNF case, at which point it's NP complete. So uh, we really don't understand this situation very well at all. Um, yeah, I wanted to just throw the floor open and tell me what other examples people know of, of uh, NP problems, either approximation problems or another one, where there's a good complexity theoretic reason to think that they're not in P and not NP complete. You know, if you take anything that's an NP intersect co NP, like problems related to factoring, of course, huge reasons to think that they're not NP complete. Also graph isomorphism. Graph isomorphism, which is nearly there, but we don't have very good evidence that either of these problems is not NP. You know, you can take a complete problem for statistical zero knowledge, except that actually none of them are known to be in NP. They're kind of just on the border somehow. Uh, you know, we just don't have a lot of a lot of great examples unless somebody can help set me straight. So, yeah. PPAD. Okay. So, PPAD. You know, we've got complete problems for you know lots of these local search classes. Um, that's probably. You know, these are these are pretty good examples. We natural complete problems there, um, and these are reasonably good examples of complexity classes. Group minimization also is very similar more or yeah. less to this, but uh, I can view a tautology applying the shortest mm -hmm. So yeah, these, which are you know, more, more commonly defined in terms of functions rather than languages, although you can, of course, define an appropriate language. And these are all typically right in the NP-intersect co-NP range. Um, yeah, but there's, there's not a lot of examples. Um, so the theorem. 
we're going to present is um, assume assume uh, cryptographic there exist cryptographically secure one-way functions. Then there is an epsilon of n that's little o of 1 such that this problem is not in p poly. p poly is the class of things that have polynomial sized circuits and is not complete under p poly Turing reductions. So probably not everybody knows what p poly and p poly Turing reductions are. Uh, does anybody want to set me straight? Uh, raise your hand if you would like a definition of these. Or okay. So first of all, a Turing reduction. Uh, you've got a typically a machine that has an oracle that it can call uh, as a subroutine for free. And if it's a polynomial time machine, then uh, you know, and you've got Oracle A, where A here A is going to be some solution to solve this um, this minimization problem. This would be the uh, type of reduction we're talking about. So we're talking about you know a com NP complete problem like SAT, not being equal to the problem solved by this machine with Oracle A. It's the most obvious reduction. And when we're talking about a p-poly reduction, is not, thank you. When we're talking about a p-poly reduction, that means that we've got a piece of hardware, a piece of circuit, circuitry, that again has the inputs down here at the bottom and has got AND and OR gates. But it's also got so-called oracle gates which are just pieces of hardware that have some number of M wires that go in there. And it outputs 1 if whatever is fed in here is in the oracle and outputs 0 otherwise. So that uh, is the problem. Um, it's a gate that solves your problem. It's a gate that solves this problem, right. So. Um, Polynomial time is properly contained in p poly, the class of things that have polynomial sized circuits, because there's all sorts of stuff that isn't even computable in p poly. And similarly, this is a very general notion of reducibility that, in particular, includes the type of reducibility that I'm talking about here. If you can do something, with a probabilistic reduction, then, um, then you can do it with a, a reduction computed by small circuits. OK? So <clears throat> it's, it, the point of it is it's a very strong notion of being NP intermediate, even if you look at this uh, very powerful notion of what's feasible and what's feasible as a reduction. So it would be a lot more interesting if we could do this even for epsilon being a constant. But still, this is a fairly uh, natural class of problems, because um, one reason people are interested in this whole minimum circuit size question is because of the so-called natural proofs framework that Rosborov and Rudich um, defined quite a few years ago now. And I'm not going to motivate that for those of you who, uh, who don't know what that is. But in general, the connection between this problem and finding circuit lower bounds is that if you want to show some function f is not in some 
circuit complexity class, saying it's not in size s. A natural way to try to do that is to identify some property that f has that makes it hard to compute. Uh, and so you would want this property to be something uh, that does not have, you know, if, if down here we've got all the functions that have small circuit complexity. If you look at the set of all truth tables that have some property Q, you want that to have zero intersection with the class of things that have small circuits. And so this property Q then would be a class of truth tables that require large circuits. And if you wanted to, in particular, show that a function requires circuit size, something like 2 to the uh, uh, epsilon n, then you're looking at exactly this type of approximation problem. So it's a, it's a re or actually 2 to the little o of n, you know, but still uh, you know, something nearly 2 to the n. You know, it's still um, a natural thing to, to try to hope. Um, this is the first theorem. The other theorem is sort of a positive result showing that this problem or a problem related to it is actually hard for a complexity class. But let's do this one first because the proof is really simple. Um, and it uses the fact that this problem, the minimum circuit size problem, has a particular strong downward self-reducibility property that seems to be pretty rare. Namely, here's the truth table of a function. And if you divide it up into little chunks, so let's say that the length of this whole thing is length n, and the length of a chunk here is something like n to the epsilon. Well, if you could solve the minimum circuit size problem, figure out actually the size required for these small chunks, that gets you a pretty bad but still useful estimate on the size required for this whole thing. Namely, uh, let's call this function f. And let's call this f1, f2, dot, 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 f to the 1 minus f to the, uh, what, n to the 1 minus epsilon, um, that the size required for function f is certainly bounded below by the size required for any subfunction fi, because in order to compute these subfunctions, you're basically just setting certain variables to, to values. So if you can compute f with a particular circuit, you just hardwire in a few bits, and that gets you a function for, for one of the, a circuit for one of the subfunctions. So that gets you this inequality very easily. And um, it's less than or equal to uh, uh, you know, 2 to the uh, pardon? The sum of the well, actually, what we're going to bound it by is the max of the max over all i of the size of the uh, f sub i's. And um, what we are. So if, if, so let's say that, in fact, in order to make this clear, the number, since I'm just setting some variables, is, let's say, 2 to the k. So 2 to the k is like n to the 1 minus epsilon. And pardon? Yes, 2 to the k is about n to the 1 minus epsilon. Um, and so you get basically this. Um, there's you know, a little you know, plus order 1, but 
it's, it's not so important. And this is, again, easy. You just kind of program it. You just build the circuit. It's not very hard to do. So, you know, this doesn't look like a great approximation ratio, and it's not. On the other hand, um, it's going to be good enough for us because um, because assume not only is this not going to be NP complete, we're not even going to be able to reduce MCSP to it. So assume that MCSP, the problem with no approximation, is P poly Turing reducible to this gap problem, gap epsilon of n sp. So the query size here, you know, on, on input, um, you know, let's call it fi. You, you get an input here of some size n. The query is computed by the circuit. of size less than or equal to, you know, let's say that the length of this is equal to n. The length of the queries are going to be n to the c for some constant c. And we will pick, uh, you know, this parameter of things that we're chopping. And so, so, okay, so we've got f, our input, of size n. Queries are of size n to the c. Let's say that this is some particular query c. We're going to chop it into pieces so that the pieces here are of length, you know, let's say less than root n. And you can do that. Um, you know, epsilon is going to be a little o of 1, and c is a constant, so n to the c times little o of 1 is going to get you something so that you can get this uh, small. And the assumption is that we could compute MCSP exactly given an answer to this approximation. And so if we knew the exact answer to the, uh, the shorter queries, we could get an approximate answer to the big query using this fact, which then allows us to compute this. And recursively, then, we're going to get the exact answer by recursively applying our reduction to the short queries. And it's just a simple, straightforward thing. You just program it, and it all works out. I mean, this, uh, just a recursive. You are going to apply this result recursively. And yes. You get, to you get the down basic, to the basic thing that you can. Right. Uh, so you want to say that from a, an exact recursive answer, I get an, an exact answer down here. You get an approximate answer here, and the reduction says that that allows me to compute an exact answer to the query here, or you know, to the the original input. So basically, if you get a, the, the, you have an approximate problem and an exact problem, and because of the of the downward slope reduction, you can reduce it in the other direction. Right, and so you know there's a. So for instance, if this reduction is a probabilistic polynomial time reduction, then this recursive procedure is a probabilistic polynomial time reduction. If this is a p poly, in other words, a reduction done by circuits, you can do this with small circuits, um, et cetera. You know, if it was a de Yeah, that's the only thing you need. Right. So somehow this 
simple observation had been overlooked. And I'm not sure, you know, this does seem to be a little bit rare that, that you can just um, chop a problem. You know, like think about a graph problem. Like if you were trying to do clique this way, if you chop it into subgraphs, you know, you destroy a lot of the, the useful information. Um, well, you, there are other, yeah, but um, anyway, so, so if you could reduce this this way, you would uh, end up with a P poly or BPP, you know, it does say P poly algorithm for minimum circuit size problem. And it was already known before that if minimum circuit size problem were in P poly, then there would not exist any cryptographically secure one-way functions. And so, um, so that shows that it's not NP complete. Um, now, in order to see that it's not NP poly, either, even this approximation, um, it's still not very hard using a lot of the hard work that people have done previously. So any questions about this? This, I hope, was a straightforward, simple idea. So how did you do it at the end, uh, one of the concepts? Okay, it was because you get the minimum circuit size problem is in P poly. And why don't I just explain a little bit about because I'm going to need this anyway. What's the connection between minimum circuit size problem and uh, one-way functions? If one way, so there's this wonderful result by uh, Hostad, Impaglioso, Levin, and Luby that says that uh, one-way functions exist if and only if uh, pseudorandom PSEUDO random generators exist. And in fact, what we also need is the um, Goldreich, uh, Goldwasser, Macaulay uh, notion of a pseudorandom function generator. And we don't need to really present all of the, uh, the definitions in order to, to get the intuition. The intuition is that actually for both of these objects, you take some short seed and you expand it to a big object that looks random. So this is a pseudo-random object. And Thus, since this is produced from a short input to a long output quickly, this has low time-bounded Kolmogorov complexity, sort of the definition of what time-bounded Kolmogorov complexity ought to be. And actually, there are a bunch of different definitions of time-bounded Kolmogorov complexity. One of them is really related to circuit size because circuits, you know, if you've got a big truth table F that has a really short, a really small circuit, well, then this is a short description of a big object. So it's not too surprising that there ought to be some connection between time-bounded Kolmogorov complexity and, and circuit size. And in fact, you can make that precise. And so, so you get this thing that's got 
very low time-bounded Kolmogorov complexity and with MCSP as an oracle, you can really distinguish the pseudo-random objects from random objects because if you just flip coins and try something at random, you get a random bit string for a truth table, then it's going to require very big circuits and will have very high complexity, whereas the pseudo-random things all have low complexity. So MCSP is a terrific statistical test, is the term that's used, to distinguish random from pseudo-random, which means by Hill that you can invert this one-way function that you used in order to build the pseudorandom generator on a big fraction of the inputs. So it's not cryptographically secure. And most results that we have about the complexity of MCSP just come down to using the same hammer over and over again. MCSP is a great way to distinguish random from pseudorandom, so you can invert functions and therefore you get hardness for you know, this class statistical zero knowledge where you, know, you need a slightly more general object than cryptographically secure one-way functions but not much more general. And similarly we can weaken this resumption and you get this uh, you know, slightly stronger statement. What yeah. happens if you do it against the PRGs that are based on well, that means that all under all of those complexity assumptions, um, you know, these things hold. That MCSP has got um, intermediate complexity. So, in other words, under complexity assumptions, you know, all of these things are true. I'm not sure if I answered your questions. No, I mean, uh, Okay, the Nissan Vigderson generator is using a different notion of one-way function, which, uh, but actually, it's, it's a different generator, yeah. Yeah, it probably won't work if you use it. Yeah. You need the type of generators that are built using COMS. So, the one-way functions that we're talking about here, let's say, are just things that are computed in polynomial time. Um, and then you need a, basically, that's just it. Uh, you know, a function that takes n-bit inputs and outputs of, you know, some polynomially related length, and you want to say that it's hard to invert on average against some appropriate notion of adversary that's trying to, to, uh, to break things. So either a probabilistic polynomial time or a class of, of circuits. Um, and the pseudorandom generators that you get there are slightly different objects, although they've got a lot of the same uh, properties. Um, uh, yeah, so Well, except I do later. <laughs> so, um, it's just a distinguisher to the classical pseudo random right. generators. That, uh, because uh, if you have them, then you have small circuit generators. So, actually, time is flying by. I didn't realize okay. quite how far. So, um, in order to show that if pseudograndom one-way functions exist, then uh, this approximation problem is also not in p-poly, just uses this same technology with the, the simple observation that if you've got some function f that is, you know, cannot be inverted with particular probability relative to polynomial size circuits, 
then you can define some function that grows uh, slightly superpolynomially that gives the minimum circuit size required to invert your hard function with the desired probability. And basically, we pick epsilon that's related to the, the rate of growth of this, this exponent. So what and is that if you could approximate minimum circuit size, even with this slick approximation, you could break some of one of That's right. That's right. In fact, you know, just any any one-way yeah, function. Course, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah, yeah. So the, what you would do is to set up, you know, you have a factor in in terms, and you just set up. Uh, so what circuit would you set up in order to use the approximate? Uh, well, you I look at the the the. the Right. So right. So let's say that the smallest circuit size that you require in order to uh, to factor is n to the uh, I don't know. Let's call it uh, b of n. Okay. Well then, getting. Uh, an approximation factor uh, that's related, you know, B is going to be, you know, epsilon is going to be related to B. Uh, you know, it's a, whatever calculation you need in, to do in order to carry out these reductions in order to say if we've got a way to use MCSP to break the pseudorandom function generator, then we can invert uh, a factoring and, and that's the, the adjustment that we need to do to calculate epsilon from B. And, you know, it's, it's all sort of off the shelf uh, uh, things just using these standard reductions. So the only thing that's really new here um, really is this part, the non NP completeness. The other thing is just. Um, just so using. How is the circuit to factor when we look at the end? Right, so well, you've got this test that distinguishes uh, random from uh, pseudo random. You had applied uh, this to the right. to the pseudo random function that right. you get out of the. Okay. Yeah. So Avi got it. Did anybody else have a question that I can uh, explain it a little bit more? Um, Really, it's, it's, um, it's just using the fact that with this as an oracle, you can invert things. So let me talk just a little bit about the other results. Um, and for this, we're going to need a little bit more history. As Avi said, a lot of people gut reaction is that this problem should not be NP-complete. But there aren't good theorems in that direction. So in particular, um, uh, Cody Murray and Ryan Williams showed that if MCSP is NP complete under very uniform AC0 many one reductions, then uh, what NP is not NP poly, and um, you know, actually the uh, the polynomial hierarchy uh, requires size two to the epsilon n for some epsilon. You know, there are some other things that you can say, but the problem here is. This is probably of the form false implies true. You know, these are things that we expect to be true, but to the extent that this is an interesting theorem, it's because we don't know how to prove these things, and so we probably can't demonstrate a reduction to show that the problem is, is NP-complete. So 
There are a lot of results like that, um, but Murray and Williams also proved an unconditional result, namely, if it were complete under so-called uh, d time n to the, let's say, cube root of n local reductions, then under that assumption, 0 is equal to 1. Okay? So if you really restrict the type of reduction a lot, then you can get an unconditional result. And not only is it you can't reduce NP to this, in fact, even if, um, if you could reduce the parity function to MCSP under this really local type of reduction, you, you'd get a contradiction. So what, is, what are these local reductions? Here's your input x, and here's, uh, let's say, g of x is the reduction you're computing. Okay, So the reduction, usual many-one reduction, you take input x and you output g of x. Um, so each bit of the output here is something that you can compute from your input in time, let's say, cube root of n. So obviously, you need random access to the input. Um, and your favorite NP-complete problems are all complete under this notion of reduction. So it's not a completely stupid thing to look at. Is there actually something like constant uh, locality or maybe logarithmic That's right. Time. That's right. So I'm not sure if everybody got that. Even if you restrict the running time to be logarithmic, and you have the fan in, you know, each bit of the output just requires on a constant number of bits of the input. Your typical NP complete problems are all complete under this reduction. So when Shuichi and I started working together, we thought we ought to be able to improve this. You know, so crucial to their proof is that this is very uniform. You've got a machine doing this. It's not about circuits doing the reduction. But let's go to the case that Avi was talking about, where you've got each bit that just depends on some constant number of input bits. This is a so-called NC0 reduction, because the depth is a constant. Uh, which is log to the zero, and you can just do this with, with fan into bits of, of hardware. So we thought, let's show that you can't even reduce parity to this problem using non-uniform NC0 reductions. And what we can prove surprised us, namely, Remember, I introduced time-bounded Kolmogorov complexity. Circuit size is one measure of complexity. This time-bounded Kolmogorov complexity is another. And you can define this related problem, you know, x comma i, such that the time-bounded Kolmogorov complexity of x is less than or equal to i. So I will define what time-bounded Kolmogorov complexity is, because this is actually uh, fairly important. When Levin defined a notion called time-bounded Kolmogorov complexity of x, he said it should be the minimum of the length of x plus the log of the running time t, such that your universal machine, this is a description d, universal machine given d 
outputs x n time t. And he had a lot of reasons for wanting to look at this. On the other hand, if you were to define a notion m k little t p analogous to this using Levin's definition, you get a problem that's actually complete for exponential time under p-poly reductions. Uh, so it's not a good candidate for talking about things that are in NP. And so k capital T of x is defined in exactly the same way. You take the length of the shortest description, but you add the running time instead of the log of the running time. But now you get this ridiculous notion that you know, everything is going to have linear complexity because the machine's got to output the whole thing. So instead, you notice, well, both of these definitions would be the same if you say, given description and a number i, you can output the ith bit of the output. And so here, that's what we do here. U of d comma i is the ith bit of the output in time t. So, so the description is still a short description, but now we're adding the run time instead of the log of the running time. And the thing that's useful about this is that this is roughly the same thing as circuit size of x if we view x as the truth table of a function. And when I say roughly the same, I mean not really very close. It's like polynomially related. But other notions of time-bounded Kolmogorov complexity don't really have any good connection to circuit size. So if it's, if it's polynomially related, why are you even defining it? Because there's a theorem that I can prove for this that I can't prove <laughs> for MKTP. So the theorem is the determinant nc0 many one reduces to mktp so the determinant of course is just a favorite linear algebraic problem but it's also a nice complexity class sitting inside p that has got a lot of nice properties. Um, so since we don't have a lot of time, I'm not going to tell you about all those nice properties, except that this is a really important complexity class. In particular, you know, it's bigger than seemingly bigger than deterministic log space. And so certainly, it's a lot harder than parity. So when we were trying to prove that parity did not NC0 reduce to this problem, we were just wrong. You know, even something that's a decent sized subclass of P all reduces to this problem under really restrictive local reductions. So in particular, you get that this problem is not in AC0 mod P for any prime P. We still don't know that for MCSP. So the proof of this uses um, the fact that Turan showed that the determinant uh, actually, let's just use what he showed, AC0 many one reduces to the rigid graph isomorphism problem. This is the problem where you get as input two graphs, g0 and g1. You want to know if they're isomorphic. But it's restricted to the case where g0 and g1 have no non-trivial automorphisms, which is what it means to be rigid. And this problem. AC0 reduces to MKTP, 
and there is an earlier theorem that says anytime you've got a decent complexity class with reasonable closure properties and something is hard under AC0 reductions, then in fact it's also hard under NC0 reductions. Um, and it's this reduction that really breaks down if you look at the minimum circuit size problem. And actually there's a more direct way that you can get a lower, maybe not more direct, but uh, appealing to earlier results. Uh, Pfefferman and Humans and Viola, maybe there was another author, had a pseudorandom generator that works for uh, AC0 mod P, except it doesn't stretch the seed length very much. It's a sublinear amount of stretch. And that sublinear amount of stretch means that when you've got a more delicate measure like MKTP, you can get you know, the argument to go through. But if you try to translate it into circuits, we just don't see how to do it. It's got to be true. It's got to be true. Um, but we don't see how the proof goes. Um, you know, it's a quarter past. I'm not sure. I can, I'm happy to sketch this as, uh, or give as many details as people want. But I. Uh, sketch as I may have the other yes. five minutes. Yes, I can. Um, and it has to be from the top of the You don't know how to do it directly. I don't know how to do it directly. While well, you're racing, can I ask a question? Yeah. Go ahead and keep Uh huh. So, is there an analogous, is it, which is kind of at the other extreme, is the permanent, is there some other kind of statement that looks like kind of like that that involves a permanent class? You don't expect it. Right. The so permanent is seemingly much harder than anything in NP. And so, we don't expect even to NP complete things. I'm sure there are weakenings, but for the theorem that we have, you know, we really rely on this lovely connection that Toran made between the determinant and this rigid graph isomorphism problem. And this is still actually about our best lower bound on the complexity of graph isomorphism. Uh, we don't know that it's hard for P or really any other big subclass of of P. Um, so let's say we've got these two graphs, G0 and G1. We're going to present this as a probabilistic reduction, which then we would de-randomize. So we're going to, so given these two graphs, and the assumption is that these are rigid, uh, pick at random a string w such that the length of w is some t, which is going to be something like, I don't know, n to the fifth. And we're going to pick um, t permutations, pi 1, pi 2, dot, 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 pi t, where these are permutations on, on the numbers 1 through n. And then we use those to build the following string z, which is um, apply pi 1 to either graph g0 or g1 according to the first bit of w. w, the first bit's going to tell us which graph we want to permute. And then we do the same thing.
so what do you note? The Kolmogorov complexity of Z, where you're not even worried about time bounded anything. So if D0 is not isomorphic to G1, that implies that the Kolmogorov complexity of this is going to be greater than or equal to roughly t plus t times log n factorial. Because with high probability, you pick these things at random. W is going to have nearly maximal Kolmogorov complexity. And these t permutations are also going to have about maximal Kolmogorov complexity. OK, so this is t plus t times log n factorial, whereas if g0 is isomorphic to g1, that implies that even the time-bounded Kolmogorov complexity of z is less than or equal to roughly uh, t times uh, log n factorial because you can specify this if you know one of the graphs, which is, you know, that's part of this small fudge factor, uh, and you need the t permutations. You know, if we want, I can just say plus n squared. So now we know one of the graphs, and we give t permutations, and we can describe all this. So you have to do some work to verify that you can really get this to go through in the time-bounded setting, but you can. And this is a big enough gap so that if you had an oracle to tell you the time-bounded Kolmogorov complexity of this, then, then, um, then you'd be able to distinguish the two cases. The reason that this breaks down completely if you're talking about minimum circuit size is, you know, what are we doing? We're basically saving one bit on each of these t trials. And, and that's not very much. And, you know, if you try to, to, I guess I can describe this easier if I describe a model of circuits where you can actually get the argument to go through. So let's say that your circuit size model is you've got AND and OR gates and negation gates, and also multiplexer gates, where a multiplexer gate, you know, you've got some fixed array A that's built into the circuit, and the multiplexer gate takes input i in binary and outputs the ith bit. So if you're comfortable with this as a circuit model, then you can go through with this as, uh, you know, the, the argument carries through with this notion of circuit size. But this is not very standard hardware. And if you really want to implement this in hardware, it's going to take like a linear number of bits and the si in linear number of gates or wires in the size of this, and that completely kills this argument. You need random access. You need random access. Um, so this doesn't seem like it ought to be an insuperable obstacle, but um, we haven't figured out a way around it. And um, you know, there's lots of ways that you should be able to approach this. Uh, there are a bunch of other results in the theorem or in the uh, in the paper. Um, in particular, this is a non-uniform reduction. What about being able to de-randomize it and get a uniform reduction? That turns out to be equivalent to circuit size lower bounds in um, either a loose sense or a strong sense, depending on which version of the theorem you want to look at. Uh, and so there are, um, you know, uniformity comes into the picture um, in, a, in a funny way. Uh, so if we really want to understand the possibility of MCSP being hard for little complexity classes, 
or even big complexity classes. Uh, you know, uniformity has definitely got to come into the uh, into the picture. And personally, I hold out some hope that it really could be NP-complete under p-poly reductions. But I go back and forth. <laughs> well, I mean, there are others, but you know, I basically I'm I'm very agnostic. How's that? 